Hey, Mike, we're back in the studio for another episode of Haven's Measure Twice Cut Once. Well, hello there, Jennifer Lee. It is always a pleasure to be back in Ramy Films to record another episode of Haven's fantastic podcast, Measure Twice Cut Once. And as always, we are talking with award-winning designers and award-winning builders about some of the things it takes to create amazing results when you're planning a project. And I'm so excited about the guests we have this week. We have Madeline from Madeline Design Group, who is a phenomenal designer with an amazing background in this industry and one of our neighbors. And we have John from Quentin Construction as well. And we're going to dig into it and learn a bunch about both of you. Yeah, I'm really excited. Like, I've known Malin for quite a few years, and John, we just met, but you seem like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so for the audience that might not know you, let's start with you, John. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your origin story? Um, I have been working, Quentin Construction's been around since 1981, so more than a little while. Started out as a tenant improvement company for my father-in-law, who was a developer downtown uh morphed into a residential construction company because we enjoyed that a lot more than commercial it's more personable and and uh gone from there so we started as mostly a renovation company we now do a mix of renovation and new build we're very client driven and uh we're just big on quality service and value and you have an adorable dog I have two adorable dogs. Oh, there we go. Chihuahuas. So, chihuahuas, cute. of course. And when we think of award-winning builders, we often think of people with engineering backgrounds or framing backgrounds or something like that. You have a very different background. Can you tell us a little about it, how it doesn't relate at all to construction? Um, I do have, I have an academic background. I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in, um, in marine biology, a master's degree in zoology, in uh, biomechanics. I did yeah. not know this. <laughs> wow, I was like Madeline shocked. <laughs> and and seven eighths of a PhD in aquaculture. So um, yeah, I, I've done a few varied things. I've been a sessional lecturer, uh, which I enjoy. I enjoy teaching, and I think that's part of what I still enjoy because we are involved with the ITA and we're we're running a, an apprentice program. So we try and build the future of construction in BC. Um, yeah, it just got to the point where I was seven eighths the way through a PhD with four kids and the prospect of endless series of postdocs with no money didn't appeal to my wife very much and the children kept wanting to eat and wear shoes and stuff. So we, uh, I'd always uh, been in construction since high school to uh, as, as a part-time thing and my father-in-law was a developer. I'd worked with him a lot during my academic career, again, to feed children and um and then we just transitioned into it and it's been great i enjoy it it's uh it's again it's especially in renovation it's a problem solving kind of approach to building and uh, yeah enjoy it i think that's great because like i believe that many degrees can help you even if they're not like you know biology maybe not necessarily like construction but they all interconnect like we had king on a recent episode and he started in biology and he was an architect so i just think a lot of times you can learn and use things from it maybe not zoology but there, there are a surprising number of builders who are biologists oh really i didn't know that yeah we, um yes and i've known it's your quite analytical a few. minds that's why well it's problem solving and it's an approach to problems that that helps i think you know many people will look at a degree not so much for what the degree is but because you've committed for at least four years to show up and do what you have to do so it shows a commitment and you can look at that and and move forward with that so Hey, John, I've got a question for you. You're, in addition to all this wonderful education that you have, you're also very active in the community as well, specifically sitting on the board of directors for something very near and dear to your heart. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, I was on the board of directors of the Vancouver Heritage Foundation for 10 years, and, and have con uh, the term is only maximum for 10 years, so I have left the board itself, but I continue to work on the granting committee and, and various other involvement with the Heritage Foundation. Um, I originally got asked to be on the board when I had worked on over half the board's houses at that time. And they thought, hmm, maybe somebody who at least has a pickup truck would be helpful. <laughs> and that, uh, and, and I enjoyed my time with the board. It was interesting. It was a different perspective on building. But uh, I have had a long commitment with 
the history of Vancouver building and and I love it and I'm very familiar with it and we do a lot of heritage work in Vancouver. That's great. I love the fact that we are preserving a lot of the buildings and like even the finding the right paint colors fascinates me too because I know in one of the seasons we followed a a heritage B renovation and the idea of like there's only so many colors that you can pick and it's depending on what area of Vancouver too has its own set of colors. There's a lot of very specific vernacular details in Vancouver. The Heritage Foundation does have a true colors program where they will come and scrape your house and tell you what your original colors were and there's grants to paint it in the correct colors. A little plug for the VHF. That's okay. Um, <laughs> But even down to knee brace design and and are they vary even within neighborhoods because a lot of Vancouver was built by neighborhood builders. So you'll see a lot of the same type of house in in the neighborhood. Like the Vancouver special I was dates from say about, that the eyes but no, but the original <laughs> Vancouver specials date from about 1906, and you'll see the same house. You see that in kits. And then you'll see the same house and you'll go and look at all the Georgians in, uh, in Carisdale. Now, did that have to do with approval of plans and just a standardized set of plans the city could approve? Or is that just easier to than redesigning a new? I, I think up until probably the, the, what we consider the Vancouver special, that would have been just what was selling for the builder. Cause, cause there's been a commercial aspect of building in Vancouver since the get go. So it was the style of the house that was popular with the demographic that the builder was building for. So the, the big houses, the big Georgians in Carisdale were for successful people who wanted big Georgian houses. Uh, the, the Vancouver, what we think of the Vancouver special, which is the, the two story box with a veranda on the front and the fig tree in the back was developed as a, uh, as a almost standard set of plans, which you could take into city hall and, and get approval for it within 15 minutes doesn't happen these days. What? <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> My dad would be happy to know that because right now, as you know, permits can take quite a while. <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about Vancouver specials. We're talking about heritage homes. And I imagine that doing renovation work on a heritage home would be difficult. I would also imagine designing a renovation with a heritage style home would also be very difficult. And that's where having a great team comes in. So obviously half of this dynamic duel is also a phenomenal designer. So Madeline, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Cause you're part of this equation as well. And I love your background cause you're not just a designer. You have a very detailed background. So why don't you introduce yourself? Cause Absolutely. this is your first time on our show. Yeah. So um, Madeline Design Group is our company. Um, we're in our 10th year of business this year, oh. which uh, is, Awesome. I uh, made it past that hump. I feel like I created a couple of humps in along the way, though, trying to produce a family. <laughs> yeah, that'll do that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, we're very excited to be in our 10th year. And um, I, my background actually comes in, uh, in another form of the construction industry. I started out as a carpenter. So I went, um, the government has a fantastic grant program where you can actually take a trade in high school. So I did my first year uh, carpentry in grade 12 and graduated and got working on the tools right away. And um, my, it was something that my high school woodwork teacher kind of pushed me to do. I had done another program through high school um, uh, that started in grade 10 for me, actually grade 10, 11, 12. It was just an evening program out of Kwantlen where I was doing an architectural drafting certificate. So through um, through high school and and once I graduated, I had those two skills on hand and um, and was able to go out and make some real money, which was great. And um, and then started my uh, started my interior design journey very shortly after. Started going to school for that at BCIT and um, and worked on the tools while going to school, which just gave me a great. Uh, great knowledge background for how everything gets put together, how construction works. Um, I had a little bit of commercial experience in, in construction. I had a little bit of residential while I was doing carpentry work. Um, and then um, and then once I finished the schooling and, and got to a point where I wanted to be with design, I, I went out and joined a firm. And then eventually went out and started a firm. Yeah. When I got sick of 
working under somebody else. <laughs> yeah. And you guys also, we actually met because you're in the same community as I am, and you'd started doing this very big renovation of this house, and it was stunning. So I wanted to reach out to you, and now I hate going to your house because every time I go back to my house, I feel so inadequate because it's so nicely <laughs> done. Um, but you guys have done some amazing things, and you've got a new office now. So lots of great things, and love to see you uh, Love to see you here with us and winning awards. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been a journey. It's been a, I call it the grind, but uh, it's very rewarding and um, and just it's it's always changing. Like we're it's such a great industry and profession to be in because uh, especially with residential design, I started out in commercial when I got out of school. I, I did corporate tenant improvement for four and a half years, and um, it was a design build company. And again, got the great kind of um details background but the creative and the personal aspect that um that was just really lacking for me and that's why i decided to start my own and and get into the residential and and get a bit more of that connection with clients and and to be able to um kind of spread my wings creatively as well and business wise too which that was something i didn't go to school for <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody that starts a business uh, goes to no. school for a business. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, like I said, it's a grind, but it's been a good one. This is why a lot of really talented people aren't able to do what you're able to do, right? Because there isn't a lot of education and business acumen. It's about how to do this and how to do that. So good on you for figuring all that out. And how many people do you have with you now? You have a pretty big team, right? We're a team of five. Team so of five. it's myself. I call, call myself the creative director, creative lead. Um, I've got two lead designers um, who run their own projects, a support designer and an operations manager who is my new lifeline. She's still a new ish in the grand scheme of things she's been with me for just over a year but it's given me the opportunity to um to really focus more on on what uh, what my designers are doing and and how we can run projects together and also have another baby which is new <laughs> oh, i think you might having another baby. another baby yeah i didn't have her th for the first one. <laughs> oh, oh i think you may having another like a third baby oh third, like, no well, no yeah, have, stop yes. it too it's a good number. <laughs> yeah no well, the, the two babies two babies in the business <laughs> <laughs> well your business is a baby <laughs> exactly yes and how did you guys get to know each other you and john like is this your first project working together yes it was so we we are now working on two other ones so okay. we've got three um, but this was, we met on this project yeah. through the clients. Through and the was, clients. Yeah, it was fantastic. I was very excited when I heard that I got to work with somebody that um, has a great experience in, or a great background in the heritage um, aspect. And it is, I just want to classify that it is, it's not a heritage zoned building, um, but we wanted to, we wanted to keep the heritage elements to what the, the to be period correct, as yeah. John likes to say. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially exterior details. Yeah. You know, it, it, the house has to look right. And and it, we didn't change the shape of the house. So it, it was this shape that it was when it was created. So the exterior details, in order for the house to feel right, have to match that shape because you can't put the wrong things on the outside of the house. The inside is more flexible and 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 the details are important, but they're, you can interpret them a little more because it's a very important that a house works for the people who live there. And that's where the strength of an interior designer is in terms of developing the right flow to a house. So a good renovation is always what a house wanted to be when it grew up for the people who are living in it. Love yeah. it. And of course, we're going to do a deep dive in that project yeah. a little bit later, the one that you won awards for. But uh, had you ever heard of Madeline before? Or I, I had. Like, yeah. I had. Um, we'd never worked together before. Uh, I have really enjoyed It's great working with a designer who has significant construction experience because a lot of stuff is really easy to draw and really hard to build. And, mm -hmm. that, and having that conversation or having that level of understanding makes it a lot easier to, to, cause during a renovation, there's always challenges. And then we, I think we were able to work through them really well to come up with good solutions that work from both a design and a build perspective. Yeah. Is it harder to plan a heritage style renovation? Be like, you know, each generation of housing is built differently, right? So you're dealing with different elements on that age of building versus one from the sixties or seventies. Is it harder to plan those renovations for those older style homes or is it easier? 
Um, I think it depends on the what you're trying to achieve out of it and how much money do you want to spend. Um, <laughs> That's always yeah. the determining factor. You can kind of do whatever you want if you have an open-ended budget. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely constraints. We we were trying to work within um, within modernizing the house but still keeping it feeling like the correct era. Um, so opening it up, creating kind of more of an open concept living, but still having that delineation between each room. So having working within those constraints um, and then structurally as well, there was the, the house ate up a lot of steel. It does have a lot of steel in it. <laughs> um, we do use a lot of steel because of the transition from a, originally the house would be a lot of little rooms. And that's structurally what holds those whole houses up is a lot of interior walls. And, and when you move away from that, you have to work with a good engineer who understands old buildings and how they transfer load. And, and you can come up with a design where you can integrate those steel and other structural elements without it really impinging on the feel of the house. Again, so you can make it work without it being obvious that there's a Jesus, big steel, 27 foot steel beam running down the middle of the house. Yeah, it must be hard to do open concept then uh, for the heritage style homes, because like you said, they were so dependent on many, many more walls and boxed off rooms and everything like that. It, it's, it's a structural challenge. And, but that's true of almost any, any new house, given the way that people want no walls, all glass and nowhere to run plumbing. So. Um, invisible plumbing, <laughs> invisible plumbing, but, but I think we were able to, to move walls around and maintain that feel really nicely for that, for that house. It, anything's possible and you just have to approach it with a problem solving attitude that we can make this work. And, and there may be a compromise here or there. We might have to move a wall a little bit, but, but generally speaking that because they're fairly simple structures. The old houses are very straightforward in terms of their framing, joist, and structural layout that we can usually work around them without a lot of, we can make it work. You can make it work. We Come to you. <laughs> we can make it work. I want a, a home that's all glass, yeah. not one would be. I want to find out about this heritage style home because that's uh, that's really intriguing to me. But before we do, we just have to take a short break to thank our wonderful podcast partners. We'll be right back. Measure Twice Cut Once is grateful to our podcast partners, Fortis BC, Vico Stone Canada Inc., and Trail Appliances. Support from our partners helps us share expert knowledge and resources with families looking to build, design, and renovate the home right for you. Vico Stone is renowned for providing exquisite quartz slabs, ideal for both kitchen countertops and vanities. Their extensive range caters to diverse preferences, offering everything from the versatile builder collection to the opulent and luxurious designs. Established as a reliable and preferred choice in the industry, they have earned the trust and admiration of local stone fabricators and interior designers. Trail Appliances makes everyday life better with the best selection in Western Canada, hassle-free delivery, and a price match guarantee. So you'll always get the best deal. Trail Appliances, make sure you'll love buying an appliance as much as you love using it. And we all need reliable and efficient equipment for comfort, health, and safety of our homes. Whether you want to adopt some energy-saving habits or take on a major energy efficiency upgrade, no matter what your budget, Fortis BC can help you save energy. Be sure to visit FortisBC.com rebates, where you can also find amazing tips on low and no-cost ways to save energy, plus buying advice for energy-efficient products. All right, we're back. We're talking about the Kitsilano Heritage Renovation, which has won, what, two Haven Awards? Congratulations. So you guys won an award for Housing Excellence winner, Best Renovation, $1.5 million and over, and Best Interior Design Renovated Home. So congratulations on both yeah, to both of you. Yeah. Is this both, you. Uh, your first awards that you guys have won? Uh, nope. <laughs> no, that one's won many I've been, awards. Yes. I've been, uh, yeah, no, we've been pushing for the awards for a few years now. I've got a nice shelf in my office. Welcome back to the winner's circle. What, John, <laughs> you've won your uh, previous award winner as well? Uh, not really. I don't enter much. Only, only uh, that, that. Only if he's got a sucker of a designer that'll do it for him. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> we, we have done a few. We've been finalists in a lot in, in both Georgie and Haven awards the last couple of years, but it's never been a big part of 
what we do, but it's nice to be acknowledged. And it's nice when you're working with a great designer and have it and a great client and having a great product. So well, she's got a closet of awards. So where do you put yours? <laughs> uh it's in the office somewhere oh, nice and uh in all seriousness of course this is a, a great big deal what does winning an award like the haven awards means to both of you um i mean it's just great recognition throughout the industry and a um, little bit of street cred for our industry peers and also just um a good marketing for clients as well just being able to say that we're award winners and talk about those specific projects um we submit projects that we're particularly very proud of and um, have worked really have just gone really smoothly with clients and um, and the the overall end result is something that everybody's really excited about so it's always just it's great great to have that extra badge of honor to to wear on a project that you already feel very proud of and 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 to know that other people are proud of you for it as well is great yes <laughs> you, what you, said. you like them i was like yeah uh... um Quentin Construction has always been a referral kind of business because um, we've been around. Just like my family company. Got it. A I, long I, time. I, you're like my dad. So, so <laughs> but, but with the right project, you know, it's, I like getting it out there. Like I was really proud of this project. This is one of my favorite projects. So it was nice to get it out there and get it recognized as for what it is. There, it, it, it was a, a great project with a great team. And, and a great client, because you can't do it without them. And, uh, and, and I think it turned out really well, and it's nice to get it recognized for that. What makes this project special for you, then, that you wanted everyone to see it? I don't know, the floors. It's a combination of a bunch of things. Like, yeah. the clients are phenomenal. Yeah. And we're happy. The whole process, like, we had some challenges with permits, delays and and just challenges moving things through the city and and some frustrations for sure um on that and just to be able to have a really great relationship with the client all the way through and then be understanding of those kinds of challenges and um and anything that came up on site that needed to be kind of um reworked or massaged during construction there was just a really good team approach to it and and so everybody's excited for the end result because you're not dreading the misery on site, which can happen like during construction. Sometimes it's just you you don't have the right mix of personalities or the, the correct equation to make it all run smoothly. And and this was just it. We had the we had the it team. Well, this show is all about that, finding the right combination, finding the right team and finding the right people. Let's take a look at this house because you guys are both so proud of it. And, and I love I love hearing the background because it didn't start out what it is now. Can you guys give us a bit of background of what you started with and what the process was to come up with the final end result? Because there's two parts to that. One, why did you do what you do? And second part, and this is always the part that perplexed me, how do you look at a house and go, well, we're just going to do this, this, and this? Like, how, where's that inspiration come from with an older home? So it's kind of a two-part. Maybe I'll get John to talk us through the initial part of the home and, and what you did and then how you kind of figured some details out. Well, I mean, the house started when when we, when our clients and we first looked at it, it had been subdivided into three legal suites. And the client loved the location, liked the look of, like the feel of the house, but uh, kind of, and but wanted to, to return it back into a single family home with a legal suite in the basement, which was already there. Um, and... They had already approached Madeline. Uh, there were some fairly, quite preliminary or not bad design drawings about what they were going to do about it. Uh, at that point, they hadn't considered changing the exterior, which at that time was red stucco, oh. which is an unfortunate choice by somebody not associated with anybody. Yeah, uh, along with some um, interesting and finishing materials. Yes, inside. yeah, uh, yeah. There were <laughs> there there was a lot of questionable design choices both inside and outside the house that needed to be fixed. Um, Madeline's design was focused on the interior, and then we were looking at changing all the windows to achieve some a more higher degree of energy efficiency. We were looking at, and it became obvious to me because that we really wanted to fix the exterior of the house. That it would never be the house that it could be if it was left with a stucco, smooth stucco exterior, no matter what color it was. Um, and it needed to have 
the correct details reestablished on the outside, the correct feel. And um, we talked to the homeowners and they, and we walked around and we, they came to the realization that in order for the house to end up where they really wanted it to, that redoing the exterior was, was going to be part of the plan. And I think one of the things that made this job easier, and, and Madeline's referred to it as well, is, is the level of transparency between designer, builder, client, you know, yeah. it was all really here, here's what we think, or here's what you, th it was very transparent and that helped a yeah. lot. Yeah, absolutely. I want to know about some really unfortunate design choices besides the red stucco. What's the worst one that sticks out to you? Paint a picture. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's just, it was, there were, so it was divided into three legal suites so that they could be rented. And so they were rental finishes. Oh, okay. They, like the f the hardwood flooring that we uncovered underneath oh. the laminate flooring <laughs> is just like, oh my God, why would anybody ever cover that up? So this and, is a renovation done in the 90s, obviously. Uh, yeah, it was about a 15-year-old reno or so. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a, a, a 90s reno done in about 2005. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Like yeah. you could tell that it was discount materials thrown in there to, 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 to get rental units out. Like they did it cheap and... It was Cheap. a <laughs> classic seventies kits rental. If you're what's well, a classic seventies well, well, kits? Well, you got to remember in, in the seventies, kits was not what it is now. It was all okay. cheap rental places. Was not together. around in the seventies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I've heard the stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that's where yeah seventies and eighties. Yeah. Yeah, it was just they they just weren't well curated materials. Obviously not. Yeah, set they, for... they were just like like spec materials. Yeah, they were just yeah and, efficient and... rental. Yeah, yeah exactly. I guess it's cheaper, but that's the one thing that it's always perplexed me about the older homes in Vancouver is why people want to cover up the gorgeous hardwood. Well, because it costs money to repair it and yeah. and and position it correctly in a home. Like, is way easier to cover it up with laminate than to refinish it and continue it into a room because because obviously the old like the original house was was chopped up into these three different suites now um and then when we demoed it we we tore it all back and we we're like whoa this is obviously well john walked us through the house because he's got the knowledge on heritage and it's just like well this is obviously where the old kitchen was and this was where the sitting room was and, and it was just so interesting and you could tell just from the floor yeah, because, where where the fireplace was. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you these are the areas that your guests would see. Whereas in the kitchen of that age of house, that's not where your guests would see. It's very different than how we live in our house now. Um, so the flooring is is cheaper, lesser expensive. We don't like to use the word cheaper. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, no, it was a really really interesting um, process in that sense. And then um, with the design of it to kind of bring it back to bring it back to what um, what it wanted to be when it grows up as as John likes to say but also what the clients wanted to see and that's what that's where our relationship with a client as a designer is so important and what we do is so important because we aren't designing houses for us we're designing houses for our clients and it's really our process and and um, our values are really making sure that our projects really represent what our clients want to see and and how they want to live in their house and what's what's important to them and what was really important to these these um particular clients was to have a house that feels um like it's like it's the correct era by but modernizing it as well still and bringing in some modern elements with um with uh technology but also the flow of the house and finishes and and kind of marrying those two was really an, a really a fun process and and creating a layout that that represents both of those was was um yeah it was just neat because they they really they had a vision but it's really about get, kind of pulling their vision out and putting it down onto paper for them so i just want to go back to something we're talking about the technology in the home we're not talking about tv and sound systems we're talking about other technology that one could put in a home from the 1900s to bring it up to 21st century specification and standards what are some of the types of technology someone should be thinking about if they have an older home and want to do a renovation of this type Probably one of the largest pieces of equipment that you would want to put in your home would be a, a good HVAC system with a heat pump. And that, that will uh, do a lot for your home. Also making sure it's properly air sealed, which doesn't necessarily, we replaced all the windows in this house. None of them were original. 
But even if you have an older home with original windows, as long as you draft seal, you can get increase the efficiency terrifically. Uh, you have to be careful when dealing with an older home because the building science of an older home is based on having huge drying potential. Almost all these houses at some point get wet, but they're able to dry. And you have to be cognizant of that when you're upgrading these, these homes, you, you bear that in mind. For our new construction, we are, we're very aggressive with our air sealing. We use entirely exterior insulated uh, wall assemblies. Um, so we're very forward on that type of technology when applied to an entirely new home. But when you're working with an existing home, you have to be careful about how you apply some of those technologies. I just have a quick question for you because you're our very first heritage expert we've had on. So I wouldn't say expert. Well, you've been on a board for 10 years. I'd say expert. But I want to know um, just about the windows. Because I know you mentioned, Madeline, that this home didn't have a designation. So you guys didn't technically have to put it up to the heritage standards. But in other ones that do have designations, do you have to keep the windows, like the original gloss in some? You should. And how do you get around that though? Because obviously they don't have R value and things that- Well, the problem, okay. All windows, even if they're triple glazed argon filled are relatively large holes in your house. Okay. The R value of a very efficient window is not that great. In Vancouver, because we have very few days where there's a really huge difference between interior and like it is in Edmonton. You know, like you're not going to have a hundred degree temperature difference between inside and outside. Not like minus 30. <laughs> no. Most of the discomfort you feel in an over home is not through transmission through the glass. It's drafts around it. Mm -hmm. And you can rebuild a, a traditional double hung window. So they are really quite airtight if you use the right ceiling. And, and that increases a combination of increasing the air tightness. And if you put either drapes on the inside or storm windows on the outside, old technology works great. When I was a kid, we used to change our storm windows, put them on in the fall, take them off in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, there's grants from the Vancouver Heritage Foundation <laughs> available for storm windows for your house. So there are a lot of solutions that allow you to keep a lot of the very traditional heritage details and increase your efficiency. See, you are an expert. I always wondered about that, so yeah. thank you. Storm windows. Storm windows. Storm First windows. thing, I learned something new all day. Like, I get it. I Because I live in a building from 1912, and it's all windows, and they've never been replaced, and I do feel the draft coming through the it's window. It's the draft that's cold. It's not, <laughs> you only feel the window temperature if you're standing, like, right in front of the window. Okay. Drapes so the air I'm too. feeling is not from the window. Okay. No, it's not coming through the glass. No. Got it. So on this project, um, obviously there were some great results that were created. Yeah. We've talked about that. There's also going to be some challenges because there's no manual on how to renovate a home because every home is different. What are some of the challenges that you faced doing this project and how did you overcome them? Because this is going to have, I mean, as an example, we know this happened during some severe fluctuations in material goods. That would be one of many challenges. What are some of the other challenges that you had to deal with in this project? How much are we allowed to talk about the city? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there were there were some permitting challenges, um, exacerbated by COVID in terms of everybody working from home, and the time the response time was slow. Uh, and the ability to, because each of these type of projects um, requires some interpretation of how the rules are supposed to work. Don't get me started on why the city should have a heritage character home stream for renovations. They don't have a separate one? I didn't no, know that. Oh, no. wow. They do for passive houses, but don't get me started on that. <laughs> but the, so... So there was that those challenges. There were a few structural challenges. They weren't too bad. Um, we did increase the scope of work significantly with the exterior renovation, and it's all done in real cedar shingle. Wow. So, and that does reflect on the price increase because the, the price of shingles quadrupled per box. So that when we decided to to uh, pursue that avenue of finish, um, 
I went out and bought every box of shingles I could that we needed for the house at what at the cheapest price I could find, which turned out to be a fairly good deal because they went from we paid around four hundred dollars a box, and they by the time the job was finished, they were retailing for just under nine. How many shingles in one box? There is half a square, fifty oh. square feet. Apparently, I should be in the shingles business. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole issue about shingles because they can only come from old growth trees because they're the only ones big enough to create shingle butts. So do companies, like there are companies there that are now doing deconstruction as yeah. opposed to just demolishing houses. Uh, by by leveraging those companies that are taking apart some of these heritage houses, can you find organic materials that work with the house or do you have to source all new materials in these type of projects? It's typically all new materials. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, um, some there's a couple of issues with, with recycled materials. Uh, flooring you can do. Um, but um, the problem with, if you're looking at a typical uh, 3 8 inch top nail white oak, which is a very traditional floor in Vancouver, when it's applied, there's 32 nails per square foot when it's applied properly, uh, which means that old floors come with 32 holes per square foot and then you fill them and then use them. So, so there's a different look to it depending on how it's filled. Um, shingles can't be removed, but we've done other houses where we have removed the asbestos shingle. Why can't shingles be removed? Because they don't come apart. Okay. They, but they you split. Do have to do asbestos. Split, yeah. asbestos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The houses that are getting deconstructed, the materials aren't necessarily being rejuvenated back into the original no. form. They're going into, they're getting recycled into other types of building materials. Yeah. And yeah. in Vancouver, you can only deconstruct now, right? Isn't that the law? There, there is a, there are recycling requirements, yeah. deconstruction requirements, yeah. So, Madeline, I, I always wonder how you figure out the things you figure out, mm -hmm. and that's probably why I'm not a designer. <laughs> well, that you need to be talented. Well, don't even but, get me started on why I don't do AV. But <laughs> <laughs> how do you get when we're looking at a project like this? How do you balance a home like that? with the rest of the neighborhood? Is it a matter of just doing some research or talking to neighbors? Like, how do you make it look like it belongs, even though it's essentially a new entity? Um, I mean, on the interior's perspective, that's not so much a concern because you don't see inside people's houses. Um, but the exterior, we had a lot um, had a lot to do with John's influence, to be honest. we um, One of my most favorable memories of one of our site meetings was doing a little walkabout uh, he took us on a tour. We had a little field trip around the neighborhood with John <laughs> and uh, and talked about some of the architectural elements of um, of some of the other houses in the neighborhood and what was correct for that neighborhood, what was correct for the era, um, and how to incorporate it into that house with um, with it all being um, the proper representation of the of of its birthday. Yeah. <laughs> And Madeline, with that, did you uh, keep any like heritage details or add them throughout in the interior design or was it quite modern inside? No, so it's quite, it's, there's a lot of traditional elements on the interior of the house. Um, we did uncover some absolutely stunning original hardwood floors um, that, uh, that were a, a huge win in the demo process. So um, we have,